remember when I was 17, I was, I was preaching at 17. And uh, our church folks, you know that I've been, God called me to preach when I was eight years old. And uh, I know what it is to be a young preacher. And, um, you know, being a young preacher, there's a lot of, um, not just the nervousness of preaching, but the nervousness of people receiving uh, what you're going to say. Because, to be honest with you, most of the time when I would preach, if I got to preach in churches, uh, I I didn't preach as much to young people as I did to grown-ups and to adults. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of nervousness that comes with being what what most people look at and say, oh, he's just a kid, and being that kid preacher and having to preach uh, preach to a room full of adults. And uh, because of that, the Lord, and I've mentioned this uh, even while Brother Seth was figuring out and trying to uh, make sure that what he believed that God was calling him to was exactly what God was calling him to. I mentioned these verses to him, but these became life verses for me from the time I was a small child. And it's uh, the words that God had to say to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter number one, uh, speaking about Jeremiah's call. And uh, Jeremiah said some things that is interesting, I believe, for us tonight, uh, hearing from a young man that God has called uh, very recently, just in the last few weeks or so, and uh, him bringing his first message tonight. When God called Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1 4, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, And this happened for Seth just uh, not too long ago when the Lord began dealing with his heart about preaching. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. By the way, it's election election time now and next week. You need to remember what God said about that when it comes time to vote. Amen. Uh, God said, before I formed you in the belly, I already knew you, and in indicating that that was a person uh, before before any of us ever before Jeremiah's mother even saw him. God said, I already know everything there was to know about you, and I had a purpose for you. So we need to remember that when it comes time to vote. Amen. Uh, I wish I wish most in Washington, I wish our president understood that. Amen. Uh, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest, uh, before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. A calling of God to be a preacher of the gospel does not start in the moment when that preacher begins to hear the call of God and to sense the call of God upon his life. Uh, The calling of God upon a man to preach the gospel happens prior to that in the heart of God. What we're seeing tonight is something that God had already predetermined for Seth before this moment ever came. And uh, I, I thought about this this afternoon. Brother Jeremy, you and Miss Valerie, y'all are, y'all are, bat- y'all are batting pretty good right now. Uh, you have two children, two boys, and both of them's preaching. And uh, <laughs> so, amen. I don't know if you guys want to try to have another one and see if you can get that going. Amen. Uh, but right now, y'all, y'all's batting average is real good on preachers. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Amen. I know I won't get 100% because I only have two boys out of three. Amen. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. In other words, God set you apart for this purpose, Seth. God set you apart for that, Kyle. God set you apart for this, Michael. Before any of us ever knew you, before you even knew what God was doing, God already set you apart and put you in a special place in his heart that he was ordaining you to be a preacher of the gospel. And then, uh, you know, I think all of us go through this, and Seth, I know you have. Verse number 6, Then said I, O Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. He had his reasons, his excuses to say no when God began to call. But notice what God said to a kid preacher. By the way, I don't want to hear, young preacher's fine, but I don't want to hear kid preacher come out of any of our mouths. Because here's what God said, the Lord, but the Lord said unto me, when, when Jeremiah said, I can't speak because I'm a child. I've got all, I've got these things that's standing in the way for me being an effective preacher of the gospel. The Lord said unto me, say not, I'm a child. 
God doesn't recognize kid preachers. He just recognizes preachers. Whether you've been preaching for 50 years or for you've been preaching for five minutes, God says, that's my preacher. For thou shalt go to all that I send thee. Remember that, young men. You'll go to whoever God sends you to. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. There's a lot of fear that comes into doing what you're about to do. God said, be not afraid of their faces. Listen to this. Why do you not have to be afraid of their faces when you stand to deliver God's word? For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. But the Bible said in verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. In other words, when God calls a man before that man even senses the call, God has separated him to be the one that declares the truth of God and the words of God to those people that he sends him to with the words that he gives them and even though he's a young person, even though he's a young child, or whatever the case may be, Jeremiah says that God wanted to remind even the young preacher, even the one that most people look at and say is inferior, you're going where I told you to go, you're saying what I told you to say, and all of it I am giving you my authority as the purveyor of my truth to say what I want you to say. And so I want us to keep that in mind, and more than, more than just us keeping that in mind, Brother Seth, as you come uh, to preach the Word of God, I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, there, are no, there, are no, there are no classes of preachers in this building, uh, from the pastor all the way to the other men in the room, and then uh, even, even for the one preacher in our church that's not able to be here tonight due to sickness, none of us are any better, none of us are any other class. We are all just trying to go where God told us to go and say, what God has told us to say. It's your first message. We're here. We're excited for you. We're all in your corner. And church, I hope you'll give this young preacher in our midst a lot of amens, a lot of encouragement, a lot of, uh, a lot of support uh, because it's in the, in the day and hour which we're living in. It's getting harder and harder to preach the truth. And uh, he's getting started out. I believe he's in a great place. And I believe God's going to use him in a great way. Amen. So preacher, you come and uh, you bring the message that God's put on your heart for us tonight, and we will hear you gladly. Come on, Brother Seth. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, in case, uh, sorry, we're off to a great start. I want to say a couple of things before I start, just to say thank you, Pastor, so much. Amen. Like you said, most people see young Pastor and just say, no, not worth my time, but he's helped me a lot through this. Amen. I also want to say thank you to God, most importantly. I am nowhere close to worthy of this. Nowhere close. I just want to say thank you. Amen. That you'd look upon me and say, preach. Amen. I don't know why, I don't know how, but I'm thankful. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I should probably should get my thing started before I waste time. I just want to say thank you. Amen. And Praise the Lord. The devil has been fighting me the last couple weeks, so that just means only good things can happen. So I'm excited to see what God does. Amen. The sickness and just a couple minutes before I even got here, I had a headache that I couldn't even see because how bad it was. So God's doing amazing things, and I'm so thankful for Amen. it. Amen. Thank and I just, I'm happy. Uh, don't worry, no, these, are, these aren't all my notes. It's just only <laughs> We won't be here all night. And uh, sorry for the lack of eye contact. I'm scared. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> You're doing well, brother. I just want to thank, um, where is she? Mom, thank you. That was a lot. That helps. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you, Kyle, for trying to help me so much. And thank you, Pastor. Amen. For everything. Absolutely. And, uh, to start off here, I just want to say, it's Jonah, and the reason why I picked Jonah is because I just feel like it's where God wanted to be. It's a small text, we can get through it easily, and I feel like we all can relate here and there some parts. Amen. I just want us to look at a few things in the Bible about the, this part of Jonah's life. This book doesn't tell us all about Jonah's life, but God uses it, and wouldn't put it here if it wasn't supposed to be here. 
Amen. to show us great lessons we can learn from him. We can learn a lot about Jonah, what we're not supposed to do. And I'd say, don't want to be too negative, but a lot of these are don'ts. And I'll make sure that we focus on some do's because there's no point in telling you what not to do if I don't tell you what to do. Amen. And, uh, uh, sorry. I uh, just want to say that we shouldn't be a Jonah. Don't be a Jonah. And we can see a lot of things in Jonah's life that he could have done a lot better. And I don't know where I'm going to put this, so I'm just going to say it now, because I don't know where I'm going to put it anywhere. If you're anything like me, I hesitated so much because, like I said, like Pastor said, I thought I was a child. I didn't think God could ever use me. And this thought that wouldn't leave me alone, and I was trying so stupid thinking about it, but I thought to myself is that if Paul was the chief of sinners, I was the least of the least, that God could never, ever use me. And I would spend so many nights just sitting there saying, no, this isn't possible. You're just making up. But I read my Bible, and I listened to good music, and they all had a key thing in it that kept reminding me, <coughs> God doesn't make mistakes. Amen. And I'm happy Amen. to know that, not because I'm special or anything, I know that for beyond a shadow of a doubt, but whatever he has planned, I want to be there. Amen. I don't want to be like Jonah, and he tells me to do something and I run. And if there's anyone out here tonight, which I don't know, but if there is, don't run. Amen. I did it, and it got me to a place I'm not really proud of. It was miserable, and tearing myself apart. And I don't think any of us should do this. So, I'm sorry. Um, like I said, I thought I was the least of the least. I didn't think God could ever use me. But He is. I hope yes, He is. Sir. I'm praying Amen. He is. Amen. If you can use me, there's no doubt that he can use you. Amen. So, uh, this we probably should get started. Um, obviously, we're Jonah. Uh, we're starting in chapter 1, verse 1. And I uh, just want to do a quick prayer before we start. <clears throat> so, I thank, thank you, God, for all you've given me. For the humble calling, God, that you've called upon me. For this is no small task, but I'm not worthy of it. But with your help, God, I'll be able to do it. I ask you, God, just be with these ones who have prayer requests unspoken or just other things, God, that may have slipped my mind. Just help them, God, to be with them. Help me, God, be my strength, be my nerves, because, and be my tongue, God, for you faileth not. Help me, God, do as you want me to do, not be of myself, God, filled with the Holy Spirit. God, help me not quench it, help me, God, kindle it. Because without you, God, this is just tinkling cymbals and sounding brass. It's a waste of time. We shouldn't even come here, God, if it's just me. But with you, God, we can do so much. I'm so thankful for that. I ask you, God, just to be with the ones that need you. Help us, God, and keep us safe. And so Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, if I can find it. I had my notes in it, and I took my notes out, so I lost it. Uh, Matthew, Jonah, Jonah. <clears throat> Jonah. I want to talk about first, my first thought is running from God. And a couple of things about how we can get in such a backson state because of this that we can miss out on so much. Right. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of, sorry, I have passage told me, I already forgot, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. And here's what I want to look at. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarsha from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarsha, so he paid the fee thereof, and went down into it. And I want to see right here. We don't see anything like Jeremiah telling God, no, this has to be a mistake. We don't see anything like the other prophets saying, God, I just, are you sure? Are you sure? Like Moses saying, but God, I'm not eloquent. Right. But we see here, without hesitation, Jonah rose and fled. Right. right. And I want to say, and I talk about pastor about this, I'm going to probably say this a lot, if we're not careful. If we're not careful, we can get into a backslidden state where we can leave God's will without any hesitation. Right. And I believe this is a message that my brother Kyle has brought up, that we need to build walls, we need to fortify ourselves, that we do not stray from what God has for us. Sure. As we see, if we read further in the text, um, chapter 1, <coughs> verse 4, But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was like to be broken. And I want to say, you're running from God. You have something that's more important to you than Him. Don't be surprised when He sends out a great wind and breaks it. Right. Amen. 
If we put things that are above God that aren't, nothing is above God, but if we try, we put things that have more value for foolish things, God will show us that we're wrong. Sure. And I think it's best that we make sure we're right so we do not have to go through a great storm for God to show us that we're wrong. Right. Amen. And I think that we should try our best, like I said, to build walls, to fortify ourselves, to make a habit of making sure that we're not so easily swayed from the things of God. Right. And then if we read, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, that there was a mighty tempest in the sea. Sorry, I'm going a little fast. So that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lie in the, of them. And I want to say right here, if we're not careful, when our backs in the states are running from God's will, we can be amongst people that we shouldn't be. Right. We can be in places we shouldn't be. Right. And we could be living how we're not supposed to be. Right. We see that Jonah was nowhere close to where God wanted. He was going on a ship in the opposite direction. And I forgot to point this out, but we see that he went down to Joppa. And figuratively, figuratively and literally, we see Jonah's life going downhill. And if we're not careful, we can be in the same place. <clears throat> And we see that the mariners, which were just sailors, and we know the stereotypes of sailors, especially P Peter, they weren't the best of people. Right. And how, if we continue reading in, in chapter 1, verse 5, then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, which they didn't believe same. We, if we aren't careful, we can be around people that believe completely different than us. Yeah. And if we continue reading, right. and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship, into the sea to lie into them. But, another but, Right. Jonah was gone down to the side of the ship and he laid and was fast asleep. He wasn't napping. He wasn't just resting. He was fast asleep. And I don't know about you, but it takes a lot for me to be comfortable to go fast asleep. That's to be, make sure everyone that needs to be here in my house is there so I don't have to worry about them. That has to be something playing, either music or just Bible reading, something to help me fall asleep. The room can't be too hot and it can't be too cold. Yet here, in the middle of a storm, I might I add, around very iffy people, right. in probably a very uncomfortable bed, he was <laughs> fast asleep. Yes, he was sir. that comfortable being out of the will of God right. that he was able to sleep in the most uncomfortable place imaginable to me. Right. And if, like I said, I'm going to keep saying this because I don't think of any other better words. If we're not careful, yes, sir. we can be that comfortable being backslidden. Right. We can sure. be that comfortable being out of the will of God. Right. And I don't want to be that comfortable, and I hope that's the same as you. That sounds awful and miserable. And then we continue reading, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 6. So the shipmaster came unto, came, unto, sorry, came to him and said unto him, What meaneth thou, O sleeper? Arise, come unto thy God, if so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. And they said every man to himself, sorry, to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil upon us. So they cast lots, and the lots fell upon Jonah. And said unto, unto sorry, they said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for who causeth this evil upon us? What was thy occupation? Whence cometh thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, and I am Sorry, the God, yes, I'm sorry, sorry. The Lord, the God of, the, sorry, I'm just all over the place. The God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men extremely, exceedingly, sorry, afraid, and said unto them, Why hast thou done this? For they knew, the, sorry, for the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And this is something that came to me. They had asked him who he was and where he came from. Right. That he'd be that backslidden, and no one knows that he was a Hebrew, no one knew that he believed in the one true God. And if we're not careful, we can be just like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like I said, we should make a diligent effort to not forsake our Bible reading, not to forsake our prayer, not to forsake our walk with God. Or we can be just like this, not being able to be towed apart from anyone in this world. And we keep reading, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 11. Then said they unto him, why sh what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be common to us? For the sea wrath and was temperest. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be common unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. <sighs> Nevertheless, the men rue hard, and this is what I want to talk about, to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrath and was temperest against them. If you're fighting against God and you try your best to do anything you can against him, Nevertheless, you will not succeed. If you try your best to run from God, it will eventually end in some horrible way. If you try to do anything without God, we will fail. 
Sure. Right. 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 So, if we can't do anything with God, then what should we do? Do everything with God. Amen. Never to forsake Him, for He never forsakes us. Right. I know we're not perfect and we make mistakes, but we should still try and make a diligent effort to be where we need to be with Him. Amen. And then, chapter 1, verse, ch sorry, chapter 1, verse 14, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hath done as it pleaseth thee. So they took up Jonah, and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. And I want to say this. <laughs> we see that Jonah did witness to the people about God, mm -hmm. but how he was, was not an example of how to do, did not show God's love and compassion. The men did not repent out of love and compassion and thankfulness. They repented out of fear. Right. And I don't want to be the example of what not to do. Mm -hmm. I want to be the example of what to do and how Amen. to do it. Amen. Because we could do so much more of being the example of what to do than what not to do. Yes. Right. I also want to say things like I said, a lot of these are don'ts and don'ts and negatives. And I don't want this whole thing to be about negatives, but we see here <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 7, 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish and the fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And this is what I want to talk about. Jonah was one back with God, yet God still heard him. Mm -hmm. Jonah was in probably the deepest, darkest place of his life, yet he still prayed unto God. Right. right. And I think we should be the very same. We shouldn't be back in darkness, obviously, no. Right. But if, I'll talk more about this as we read through it, but even if we're on the mountaintop or in the valley, we should give thanks to God. Amen. <coughs> we should not wait until things get to the worst, the bottom of the bottom, to start praying. Right. We should always be there, always seeking God's face, always sure. trying our best to have a closer walk with Him. Amen. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 2. And I said, and said, I cry by the reasons of, of my afflictions unto the, the Lord, and He heard me, heard me in the darkest time, the darkest part of my life. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and have... And thou, and sorry, and thou hast heardeth my voice, for thou hast cast me out of thy sight. I'm uh, sorry, for thou hast cast me into the depths, in the midst of the sea. The floods compass me about; all thy billows and thy waves pass over me. Then said I, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again yeah. towards thy holy temple. Amen. Amen. Jonah was backslidden, far from where God wanted him to be. Yet he wanted to get right with God. He wanted to do what was right with God. And he made a diligent effort. He did not forsake God because God forsook most of the uh, worst words to say, but forsook him, not really, but you get what I'm saying. We continue reading, we see more. Chapter 2, verse 5. The waters compass me about even to my soul. The depths close about me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. mountains. The earth with her bars around was about me forever. Yet, hath thou brought up my life from a corruption, O Lord? He was in the most wickedest place he could be, the most darkest place he could be, no hope of getting out. Yet, God heard him. God brought him out of it. So I'm saying this. If there's anyone in here, which I'm not pointing fingers, I don't know. If there's somebody in here that's running from God's will, who may be back so they know where he needs to be, God isn't a wrathful God that once you get right with him, he'll cast you away and punish you. It's not how he works. He is like the prodigal son's father. He's waiting for us with open arms. Right. And He will help us if we get right with Him. He will pull us out of the depths, out of corruption. And I'm so happy to know that we have a God that is not so Amen. scornful towards us Amen. when we fail. Amen. I praise God for that. Amen. We continue reading. Praise the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 7. When my soul fainteth within me, I remember the Lord. Amen. And my prayers came unto, into, unto thee in thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. And like I said, with nevertheless, the men rue hard to bring it in. If we don't have our hope in God, we're not going to go anywhere. Sure. We're not going to do anything. We have no hope. We forsake our own mercy. So, like I said, I don't know if anyone's here is in this position. I'm not pointing fingers. But if there is, forsake your vanity, your vain Sorry, I lost my place. Vainful, uh, observe lying vanities. Forsake them. Do not forsake God, but forsake them. 
Amen. Right. right here, like I said, Jonah's in the deepest, darkest places. He's not in the best place ever. But chapter 2, verse 9, we still see him give thanks. Sure. But I will sac sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray that I have pay that I, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And thank God is of the Lord and it's not of ourselves. Amen. Right. Amen. <sighs> And then we see the Lord heard him. After all this he's done, after all his backslidden stuff, after being in this dark place that no man could ever find him, God found him. Right. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, so I'm sorry, I missed a part. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited him out, Jonah out, upon the dry land. Mm -hmm. Chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my place. And now Nineveh was a great, exceedingly great city of three days' journey. And this is the part I want to take a look at. But Jonah got, began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What if Jonah was that dedicated in day one? They didn't run from God. They didn't waste the time going, trying to go to Tarsha, going down the Joppa. But it was that dedicated. If he could make that journey, three exceedingly days journey to Nineveh, in one day, what if he tried that? It was that dedicated day one. And I say that we shouldn't, like it says here, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. We shouldn't run from God the first time. We should not wait for the second time. We should not waste time because we don't know what might happen. If Jonah was that dedicated on day one, who knows how many souls he could have helped. We don't know how many souls perished while Jonah was out running away from God. We don't know. Right. We don't know. Can I say this? Don't waste time. But we, no man knoweth what tomorrow may bring. Amen. But I want to say this. We see God use Jonah, but Jonah's heart wasn't really in it. And we can see in later texts, which I'll get on, but continue reading for... Um, sorry, I forgot the word. Let's just continue reading, please. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the grace of them even to the least of them. For the word came to the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth. And he sat in ash and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything, let them not eat, not feed nor drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloths, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every man from his evil way, and from the evil that's in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent, and, sorry, mm -hmm. will turn and repent, and turn away from his fierce anger, though he perish not? And the, God saw their works, that, he, that they turned from their evil ways, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. This is something I want to talk about. As far as I know from reading the Bible, I don't see anywhere when people were trying to get right with God and complaining fast and fasting to try to get right with God that they ever had to stop the animals from eating. They had to ever cover them with sackcloth. But they were so willing and diligent to try their best to get right with God that they did went above what was right. needed. And I say that as Christians, we should do more than just the needed, sure. the bare minimum. We should give God everything we have and try our best. I don't want to be a Christian that's comfortable just swarming a pew and going home. I don't Amen. want to do that. Amen. I don't want to be a Christian that's comfortable just throwing a track at somebody and then walking away. Right. With my shyness, it's the best I can do is leave a track, but still. <laughs> but I want to be more than that. I want to go above and beyond what is the bare minimum. Right. And we see these people doing it. And because they did this, God turned away and repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them. And I'm so happy to see that. That... If we do more and go above and beyond what we're supposed to do, God will help us. He will answer and reward our diligent effort. Chapter, um, two, chapter 3, verse 10. And God saw their, wicked, sorry, saw their works, and they turned away from their wicked ways. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And this is my next point, doing it for the right reasons. Right. But... There's a lot of buts with Jonah, and that's sad to say that he was so bitter after everything that God put him through that he was still so willing, easily to fall back into this, this bitterness and unwillingness to do God's will. And if we're not careful, like I said, I'm saying that a lot. If we're not careful, we can do that. We can get in that way where we're so easily swayed by our emotions. And I'm not just saying this because I mastered it. I know we can do this. Right. 
But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And we can see his bitterness and foolishness in right here. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before, un before unto Tarsha, for I knew that thou, O Lord, what a glorious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repent of the evil. Can anyone tell me what is bad about that? What about all these things Jonah just listed that makes God wrong? We can be so <coughs> backslidden and so developed and consumed by our own bitterness that we can take everything God has given us that's good and try to throw it in his face. Sure. And like I said, I'm not pointing fingers. I don't know. I just know that these things can happen. And it's sad because we see what God did with Jonah. Jonah was saved Nineveh, basically. Well, he didn't save Nineveh, but God did. We know what I mean. God used him to help Nineveh. That's right. But could you imagine what he had done if his whole heart was in it? That he gave his all? And I can't pronounce this. Pastor, like, yet again, Pastor told me how to pronounce this, but I forgot how to say it. There's a book of prophecy. Huh? Nahum, thank you. And Nahum is prophesizing of um, Nineveh being backslidden again. So we see here that they got wrong with God again. Could you imagine what could have happened if Jonah gave it his all? He didn't run away and stay there and disciple them like he was supposed to? How they wouldn't have gone back to God? Mm -hmm. And I want to say this. Israel had some of the best prophets. Sure. But they still backslidden over and over again. Right. But what if? I don't want to be the Christian that could have done, sees what didn't happen, and go, what if? Right. I'm much rather give my all, and if it doesn't turn out well, and the people don't accept, or the seeds I plant don't grow, I know that I gave my all. I don't have right. to think about what if. Right. Right. I think that we should do that. Right. I find it pointless to try and build something with the intent of it falling and breaking and shattering. Amen. It doesn't make any sense. That's right. So I, we should make a diligent effort if this is not already what we're doing. To give it our all, to do everything we have, to give our whole heart, to do it for the right reason. Because we don't know what could have happened to Nineveh. We don't know what could have been done if Jonah gave it his all and did everything he could. And we see that because of his bitterness, he lost out on praising God. He lost out on fellowshipping. Right. We continue reading in chapter 4, verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, begging him to do this, my life from me. Could you imagine it, have just done this amazing work for God and being so consumed with bitterness that you want to die? I don't, who does that help if he dies? It doesn't help Nineveh. We see in Nahum that he turned right back to the wicked ways. If Jonah stayed there and did all he could do and discipled and helped and built churches and been basically a missionary, there could have been so much more that this could have been. And we continue reading um, chapter 4, verse 4. Then said the Lord, Doth thou well to be angry? No, it doesn't. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Like I said, he did all this. He sent there 40 days and preached constantly to them. Right. Yet he sat on the outside waiting for it to be burnt to the ground, waiting for God to smite it. It's foolish to sit there for 40 days and not expect anything to come of it. That just shows you that his heart wasn't in it. He didn't do it with everything he had. It's foolish to work so, well, I wouldn't say diligently because he didn't do it, but to spend so much time on something, especially for God, and not give it your whole heart. It doesn't make sense. And we see that he's sitting here in the middle of nowhere on the outside of the city in the hot sun, trying to take garbage and put it together to shade himself from the sun. Yet the people in Nineveh, the mariners on the ship, they're all praising God. They're all glorifying him and sacrificing and making vows. He's out here in his own self-pity, in his own sorrow, asking God to kill him. Mm -hmm. Do you see a difference? Because I do. Sorry. That just doesn't make sense to me. If God used me for something great, I want to be there in the middle of it, praising him for it. I don't want to be in the outskirts, leaving and running, and not doing what he's asked me to do. And it's very selfish and foolish of Jonah for what he has done. And I don't want to be like that. And I hope that's the same for you, that you don't want to be like this. And don't worry, we're almost done. But and we see, <clears throat> actually, are we? Doesn't matter. So thanks, Mark. <laughs> and so I'm trying to find my next point. And here's the final thing. 
being more concerned about selfish, temporary things than the things that really matter. Right. Wow. Chapter 4, verse 6. And the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad. I believe he was exceedingly glad of the gourd. And I believe that God did this, trying to show Jonah that his bitterness and wickedness was foolish. Mm-hmm. That if you would get, well, let's continue reading so you have the context. And the Lord prepared a gourd that, and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over, yes, shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm the morning, it rose up the next day, and it was smote, and sm- it smote the gourd, and that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did arose, God prepared a venomous, sorry, venomous wind, east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and withered, wished in himself to die, and said, it is better for me to die. And I just want to say here, God used that gourd to show Jonah that his bitterness was foolish. Sure. That, if you continue reading, sorry, but I probably should just finish, <laughs> um, chapter 4, verse 9. And God said unto Jonah, Doth thou well to be angry? Yet again, he's asking him, it does it, because it really doesn't. For the gourd, being angry for the gourd. And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. No, it doesn't. And he said, I will do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity, pity, on the gourd, for the t- which thou hast not labored at all. Labored, neither madeth the grow, which cometh up in a night, being bored but temporal things, and perish in a night. And God says this, and should I not spare Nineveh, that great city where are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? I really don't get the cattle part, but I get the people part. <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. Jonah cared so much more for that gourd that he was so happy for it and was grieved, and it came up in a day and perished in a night. Yeah. And there's people out there, I'm not saying it's you, but I've seen people. They care more about cars, care more about houses, care more clothing. Mm-hmm. They won't even take the time to leave a track. The very simple thing you can do. And we shouldn't. We shouldn't be those kind of people. Like I said, if we're not careful. We could be these people. And I'm not right. pointing fingers. I'm not saying anyone here is. But even I, if we're not careful, can be just like Jonah. Sure. We can miss out on praising God. We can miss out on glorifying people. Uh, just give me five more minutes, please. <laughs> and um, we just miss out on so much. And be more concerned about these temporal things that when it's all said and done, we'll be gone. Right. These souls will last forever. The people of Nineveh, they'll be here until the end of time. Sure. But that gourd, gone. It didn't even last a week. It was gone. Yet, Jonah was so bitter and grieved over the gourd yeah. and not the people. Mm-hmm. And I want to say this. I know I'm not, like I said, I keep saying this. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not calling one here. But I know, I know people that are more concerned over little things. And they'll say, why has God not used me? Why has God not done this? Mm-hmm. And like the parable that Jesus said about the servants that had five and brought back ten, had two and brought back four, and one had none, one and brought back none, just one. God's not going to use you. He's not going to give you more if you don't do what you sure. well with what you have. Don't be surprised when you're sitting there with nothing because you're not doing anything. Right. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I want to make sure that my life is proof that God has done something with me. Amen. I want to do the best I have with what little I have. That's why I'm here. Like I said, I don't think much of myself. I don't know how good this is, but I know if God's doing something, it's worth something. Sure. Amen. And I don't want to be like Jonah, who cared more about the stupid gourd. Sorry, I probably shouldn't use that word. <laughs> <laughs> Foolish gourd. <laughs> and cared more about himself and what he wanted to do than what God wanted or the people of Nineveh. And like I said, there's so many people out there. I know family members that have thrown their wives, that's our wives, lives away for such foolish things. And actually some of them have done that, sadly. <laughs> and I see them, and I see that they're having their own children, and they're just miserable. That scares sure. me. Right. I don't want to be the father right. who put God second and whatever I wanted first. Amen. Right. How are my children supposed to know that God's important if I don't even treat them important? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's something that God put on my heart. I don't know why, but He has. I'm so fearful of that happening. Mm-hmm. And there's so many people out there that don't care. Yeah, they teach sure. their kids that's fine to run off and do sin, do wickedness, and it's sad. Yeah. Like I said, God's not going to give us more if we don't do well with what we have. Right. And I personally believe children are pretty important. Amen. Right. And that we should do the best we can. I don't know why I'm going off on parenting, but that's where God's leading me. 
Sure. I feel like children are a little more than a couple um, talents that or somebody gave us and try, wants us to invest. I believe they're so much important. Sure. Right. And that, like the Bible says, like the um, one missionary we had to Brazil, mm -hmm. there will become a next generation, and if we're not careful, they will not know the Lord. So we need to make sure what little we have, we do the best we can. We need to make sure that we're always in church and we're always here for the right reason, not just to right. say we're here. That's right. We should make sure that everything we do is for God and for the right reason. Mm -hmm. That's right. I have a lot of people in my work, and a lot of them say they're Christian, but I have to leave sometimes because of how they talk. Yeah. There's some very wicked things I said, and they said right in front of me. Yeah. They did not, weren't even bothered that this Christian, and I've said this on several occasions that I am that, they did not care. Especially I'm underage, so talking about these wicked things is really surprising. They don't care. We sit out there on the dock and load these trucks and they just ram all these wicked things they did all week. Yeah. And it's surprising that they're so comfortable sure. with this. Right, preacher. And if we're not careful, we'll be just like that. Right. Like I said, we won't be any different from everyone else in this world. Yeah. And that's not what I want to be. Sure. Like I said, I don't want to be the example of what not to do. I want to be the example of what to do. Amen. God doesn't give us what He gives us just for us to sit there and complain that He doesn't give us more. The little we have, we should do what the most we can with. Mm -hmm. And I just, I want to say this because God put it in my heart. If there's anyone out here that thinks they're too far gone, either lost or just backslidden, we can see the people in Nineveh. They were the great wickedness that cried upon me, sorry, they came upon me, up upon me. Yet God still, say, helped them. They still got right with God and they were spared. So no matter how far you think you've gone, no matter how much backslidden you are or lost you are, God will always be there. Sure. He'll always be willing to repent and save you. And I'm so thankful that we have a God that is not just what we do, sorry, but we do and how we do it. Because salvation is not of us, it's of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So I just want to say, you're not too far. You're not too little. You're not too weak. Amen. God will use you. Amen. God will help you. No matter what you've done in the past, we see David. David was an adulterer and a murderer, yet he was still a man with God's own heart. Right. Amen. Moses openly said, Lord, I am not eloquent, I am slow of speech, yet God has done all those crazy things he's done with him. Sure. We see Paul, Paul was a murderer, mass murderer, he did all those wicked things, and God, he's one of the best Christians that we have in the text about Jesus, but right. Jesus is Jesus. Right. <coughs> so, nothing is too little for God. Amen. Nothing is too big for God. No matter what trial we're going through, no matter how weak we think we are, God is big enough. Amen. That's why I thank God for this. Without Him, this would be a waste of time. Amen. Without this, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I'm really surprised how calm I am for everything being considered. <laughs> but I just want to thank you, Pastor. And I want to thank God for all of this. Amen. And you all can sign now, because I am done. <laughs>